So that shows basically that what we have found for the variance of x, the sentiment index in fact carries over to prices as well. We have a similar behavior of the volatility of prices. Prices are more or less volatile depending, among others of course, on uh, the interaction intensity of the speculators. And you find the same plot for all second moments. What is also interesting is to look at transient dynamics as we did before in the pure interaction model. We could look at a number of shocks to the system and look at the transient behavior both of the mean value and the volatility. One possibility would be a shock to, a fun to the fundamental value. And another one would be a shock to volatility, which is perhaps intuitively a bit harder to grasp. <clears throat> if we get a shock to the fundamental value, we see the following pattern. I assume here that's PF, this straight line here. PF is simply increasing because of good news. Yeah. At time period 10, the system was in a stationary equilibrium before, so it had fluctuations. Fluctuations uh, characterized by a price on average equal to its fundamental value and by stationary values of the variance of prices, certain fluctuations, and the variance of x, the sentiment index. And I assume we are in the unimodal regime here. Yes. Relatively weak interaction among agents. And then this is the outcome of a simulation, but it's a generic result of the dynamics of uh, the system here. What you see is, in terms of the expected movement of the price, overreaction and mean reversion. Which is quite interesting because this is a standard finding in many event studies. That after an information event, you get an overshooting, you probably see that even with the naked eyes in the data, you get overshooting and mean reversion, and it's what you see here. Uh, here you see the interaction with the speculative component. The increase of prices, which is first governed by the fundamentalists, leads to the emergence of an optimistic majority among uh, the chartist speculators, and that of course is responsible for the overshooting. The emergence of an optimistic majority leads to an increase of prices that is higher than it would be if there were only fundamentalist traders. But then eventually this optimistic attitude gets disappointed, so to say, because price increases are limited, and then the optimistic majority gets lost. It even turns into a pessimistic majority for some time, and then it fades away. Yeah? This is the fading out of the influence of the speculative activity, and this also leads to uh, fluctuations of prices which are fading out over time. But you have the typical pattern of overreaction of prices and mean reversion afterwards. And in addition to that, if you look at the variances, you have a typical pattern of predictability, so to say, of this kind of behavior, which is, so to say, the extra information we get here compared to alternative models, which do not have this stochastic format. You see the variance first declines, and then, in cycles, uh, readjusts to its original level. What is the meaning of this behavior? Now, the meaning is that this overreaction pattern is a very predictable pattern. Yeah? It's a very predictable pattern. There's more predictability than in normal times. If you have an information event, then in this data generating process, the behavior of speculators the interacting chartists together with the fundamentalists is very predictable. And then, of course, over time, predictability gets lost. And we are back in the average level of fluctuation, so to say, if uh, the mean reversion and overshooting pattern has died out. It tells you something about, if you believe in this data generating process, of the precision of your prediction of an overreaction to news.
this is what happens after volatility shocks. I simply change volatility at a certain point in time. Yeah. I increase volatility. That's hard to explain in words. That's actually hard to explain in words. To only shock volatility. It might simply be uncertainty. Yeah? Uncertainty entering the market. And the basic message is you have persistence. You truly have arch effects. You have persistence to a volatility shock. If at any point in time, simply the uncertainty to the market participants or observers in it will revert back to its original level, but in cycles, and will stay above the long-term volatility for quite some time. So you have positive autocorrelation of volatility. And the same happens for X. In fact, volatility of prices, if we only shock the volatility of prices, leads to an increase of volatility of sentiment, because sentiment, of course, then is less predictable than it had been before. Somewhat similar to the previous exercise of overshooting is the analysis of cyclical variations within uh, the oscillatory regime. You know, we have now also, as I have shown before, the possibility of persistent oscillations between overvaluation and undervaluation. That's, of course, pretty unrealistic. Yeah. That's pretty unrealistic that you, have, uh, that you have harmonic oscillations, but it's one of the outcomes here. But what is interesting is how, with these variations of the mean values, yeah, these are the fat lines for prices and sentiment, how with the development of mean values, the variances do co-evolve. Here you see the variance of prices, and here you see the variance of sentiment. You see the variance goes through cycles of high predictability and low predictability. And if you look closely at it, what is very predictable, in fact, is the behavior around the turning points because there the variance is at its minimum level, it's relatively close to zero. And what is highly unpredictable is the behavior during the intermediate phases. The intermediate phases here. Because then, if you imagine that now as a stochastic process, the mean value of a stochastic process, it could easily turn around. It could easily turn around due to some external disturbance. So you have different degrees of predictability, again, over the cycles here. And these can also be visualized by 95 percentage intervals of predictability. And you see these are very narrow around the turning points. So if the market in this particular data generating process has reached a certain level of overvaluation or undervaluation, then for me, as somebody who knows the data generating process, the turning point is extremely predictable. I can very well predict the turning point, but I am less certain about my predictions in the downward phase and in the upward phase after the turning point has been reached. So we have different degrees of predictability. Here, there might be much more variation of prices, uh, whereas here, the variation of prices is relatively limited and we would have a lot of exploitable investment opportunities. So what we get here, to just summarize, is a number of interesting findings. That's just for, so to say, illustration of the spectrum of, of things that you can analyze with a model of this type. The most important one, perhaps, and the most realistic one, is the overshooting and mean reversion pattern that we find together with the predictability of overshooting. What is less realistic, certainly, is, and also interesting, is the volatility persistence, because that's what we see in the data. 
Of course, oscillatory regimes are less interesting because they are certainly uh, different from uh, what we see in reality. Now, but this model was only something like an intermediate step towards a more realistic model because we wanted to learn something about the behavior of agent-based models with a diverse heterogeneous group of interacting agents in financial markets. And eventually, going through this literature uh, to which we have contributed in our group, uh, we came up with a slightly richer framework that was published in Nature actually for the first time in 1999, and there are some other papers on this particular framework, um, where you don't have predictability anymore. We still have the different types of traders, noise traders and fundamentalists. For the noise traders, I have the same behavior as before. I have the same demand and supply functions as before. And the new feature is that I now allow the traders to switch between the group of chartists and fundamentalists. And they switch between fundamentalist and chartist behavior according to the past success of these strategies. So they compute something like profits. It's a bit complicated to define the profits, but at least one can get some proxy for what the profit might be from the viewpoint of chartists and fundamentalists. And they switch, because it's easy to compare these, at least virtual profits, they switch in tendency with a certain probability. Again, this is a transition rate which is used for this purpose, they switch to the more successful group. That's the major new component here. And another new component is uh, for the sake of comparability between fundamental dynamics and price dynamics, that we assume that the fundamental value changes over time according to a Weiner process. Right. A simple Weiner process just to have some fundamental information, some exogenous information as an input to the system and see how the system reacts to this fundamental information. Do you still distinguish between optimistic and pessimistic? Yeah, yeah. So yes. everything is included uh, as before and we only expand the model by allowing this additional type of switch between fundamentalist and chartist behavior and changing the input. The point here is, and that, that really goes into what we wanted to explain with these models from the outset, uh, that we want to explain empirical characteristics of asset prices like fat tails and trusted volatility. And in order to, to show that in principle, these stylized facts, as they are called, can be emergent properties of the market interaction, we use a fundamentals process that lacks these stylized facts. So if the prices or returns have fat tails and clustered volatility, as they emerge from our simulations and from the analysis of the model, then this is due to the interaction of the agents in the market and not due to similar properties of the fundamental news arrival process. It's all formalized in the same way, so we are already pretty familiar with that. We have our jump Markov uh, framework for each individual to switch with a certain transition rate from one uh, behavioral alternative to another. Asynchronous reaction, that's all pretty well known. Again, these transition probabilities that we have studied before for the optimistic and pessimistic charges. We have a simple formalization, stochastic formalization of the price dynamics. That's actually something I have skipped before. We implement these Valrasian dynamics in a stochastic framework simply by saying if excess demand is positive, then with a higher probability the price will jump up and down and vice versa. And the new component is the switches between noise traders and fundamentalists, so chartists and fundamentalists which are again governed by the same exponential transition rates where in the exponent now we have the profit differential, which is a lengthy formula. Uh, the profit differential value, you have to think about it, 
for the chartists, actually, since they bet on price changes, it's simply the capital gain or loss. So this is easy to define, whereas fundamentalists have a more long-term perspective and bet on a reversal of the price to the fundamental value so that we use expected profits of fundamentalists, which are the percentage difference between the prevailing price and the assumed fundamental value. This is the exact formula for the profit differential that we use. It also includes interest, in fact, dividends here. Uh, these are nominal dividends divided by the price, and this is an alternative uh, return from, from alternative investments. So that's the excess return, including price changes of the, fund, of the chartists. And this is the fundamentalist profit, um, the expected profit. <coughs> Uh, it's the percentage deviation of the price from the fundamental value uh, times a discount factor S because of the time it needs in the view of the fundamentalist for the price to revert to the fundamental value. It's ad hoc to some extent, but it's hard to come up with something better. It captures the main ideas of chartist and fundamentalist behavior. from one to the other direction. Chartists from the pessimistic group switch to the safe haven of uh, a risk-free interest rate and therefore their excess profit is R minus this expression here because they expect price changes to be negative and therefore to have on average negative returns from investing in the particular market that we investigate. So that gives us now an even more complicated system. We can look at the mean values, at the mean values, and then we get the sentiment index again. But we also have to look in order to characterize the change of uh, the population composition at the fraction of noise traders. This is called Z, the fraction of noise traders, which is now also changing over time, or chartists. I use uh, noise traders and chartists as synonyms, and we have the price dynamic. So we have one more dynamic component, so to say. We move from a 2D to a 3D system. And then I could give you some results on the existence of equilibria. Maybe I skip that. I could give you some results on the stability of equilibria, but more interesting is to look at simulations. This is now one typical simulated time series of returns. And this is the fraction of chartists among all traders. And the basic message is that it looks very similar to empirical data. It looks very similar to empirical data. And this is a, what the theoretical results actually show is that this is a generic feature, in a sense, of this model. Also, you might think the guy had so many parameters in this model. I don't know how many, 10, 11, something like that, if you count all the parameters. The dynamic behavior is the same, in a sense, in a qualitative sense, for all choices of parameter values. So the model is entirely robust in its behavior, and one implication of the robustness, so to say, is the fact that we always get time series which have, which have fat tails and clustering of volatility. And as you see, the clustering of volatility is related to the development of the population. Yeah? If you have a high fraction of charges, then it probably should be like this, you also have an outbreak of volatility. The theoretical results, in fact, tell you that there is a continuum of equilibria, in a sense, in a dynamic system sense, which all have, on average, a price which is equal to the fundamental value, but which are not all stable. So you have 
I think you discussed about systems of that type when we arrived in the airport yesterday. Yeah? Continuum of equilibria, a line of equilibria in 3D, three-dimensional space. P is equal to PF in all of them, but they are not all stable. And then we have a situation where the system always tends, in a sense, towards a stable, steady state, one out of the set of stable equilibria, but it can be easily destabilized through the stochastic components of the dynamics. Yeah? So we have something like a mixed situation in terms of stability here. And this can be understood as a kind of local bifurcation. There's always some noise. And most of, the system, most of the time, you only have minor fluctuations. But if you have minor fluctuations, the system is randomly moving along this continuum of stationary states. But only part of it is stable. So at some point in time, it will move or it will uh, go beyond the boundary between the stable part and the instable part. And then you will get an onset of large fluctuations. Every once in a while, that's what it means. The stochastic motion, and you can also think about news about exogenous factors, will push the system beyond or to the neighborhood, which is already sufficient, of the stability threshold. And then you will have the onset of severe fluctuations, which give you the clustering of volatility. And this is a different snapshot from a simulation where I also show you the development of the fundamental value. The light line is the fundamental value. The thick line is the price. There's only, I have only shifted them by a constant in order to make both of them visible. Otherwise, they would collapse. You wouldn't see them. You wouldn't see both of them. So it doesn't mean that the price is above the fundamental value. It's just, just for visibility, it has been shifted a bit. And you see that the price closely tracks the fundamental value. This is the increment of fundamental values, the Wiener Brownian motion, normal distribution, the input to the system. But the output to the system, again, the returns looks different. So the market transforms the normally distributed input into an output in terms of returns, price changes, which has apparently volatility clustering and fat tails. So it's generated via the intrinsic dynamics of the market. And our very simple model of chartists and fundamentalists, chartists switching between optimism and pessimism, traders switching between chartism and fundamentalism, according to the simple description of profitability, is sufficient to generate this result. And if you look at these returns, you see that there's practically no predictability. It's hard to show, theoretically, because the model is complicated. But what we also did was a lot of econometric tests on the computer-generated data. And my co-author in this paper, Michele, in these papers, Michele Marchesi, actually is a very good uh, computer scientist and an expert on artificial uh, intelligence models. He was very keen in finding structure and finding profitable uh, trading strategies, but he was unable to do so. So essentially, from a practical point of view, I cannot show martingale behavior here. It might depend on parameter values, but from a practical point of view, if I use these time series, they are practically undistinguishable from empirical time series. And that motivated us to propose something we have called the interacting agent hypothesis. Uh, the dynamics of asset returns arise endogenously from the trading process. That means the market interactions, in our view, magnify and transform the news into something that is fat-tailed and has clustered volatility. So the market is what is responsible for these features of the data. And this is in contrast to the efficient market hypothesis that would state that these characteristics stem from the news arrival process and would, and would simply reflect fat tails and cluster volatility in the news arrival dynamics. Yeah? So you would say it's the news. The news have fat tails 
the news come with clustered volatility, and therefore there is no scope for economic analysis in a sense, but as we show hopefully here, well, at least as we argue, uh, you can easily come up with a model that produces realistic output, even so the news arrival process that is the input to your system has neither fair tails nor volatility clustering. Okay, yeah. That's essentially sweet. <laughs> That's essentially uh, what I wanted to show. As I said, if you have still some time and want to see something, uh, I can, after a short break, also tell you something about estimation, which is something I started to do recently, estimation of the parameters of these models. <laughs>